the reason people study with me in New York is because of what I learned through my analysis assessment and design process for one of the largest cities in the world. And what I did was I looked at New York City as an urban metabolism. And you'll hear this term used a lot in green design for cities, urban metabolisms. And what that's talking about is saying, what are the inflows? What are the outflows? How do you start to keep them from just being something where cities are kind of hemorrhages of assets and hemorrhages of resources with crazy pollution legacies downstream from them and turn them into something that actually has a restorative, regenerative, beneficial relationship to outlying areas and downstream. This is the Regenerative Real Estate Podcast. Revitalizing the world together. Welcome to the Regenerative Real Estate Podcast. This is your host, Neil Collins. It is a show that is supported by our work at Latitude Realty. In it, we explore our natural and built environments and how they can be used as a force for good. The show sets out to inspire impactful ideas, meaningful change, human wellness, and ecological restoration through interviews and easy to digest conversations. Our guests range from industry leaders to iconoclasts, from both well-known figures to everyday people leading extraordinary lives. This is a show for people looking for education and inspiration on how real estate can be done differently. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another podcast of the Regenerative Real Estate Podcast. I am very excited about today's guest. I was just telling him how much I've been looking forward to this conversation. It is with Andrew Faust from the Center for Bioregional Living out of Ellenville, New York. And he is a visionary permaculture and bioregional educator that taps into the rich synergy between permaculture and biodynamic agriculture. Andrew, welcome to the show. Thanks, Neil. Great to be here. I, I, I'm really excited. I told you this before. I, I found you through the film Inhabit, which if anybody hasn't seen it, oh my goodness, like what a beautiful job of multimedia storytelling. And I've known about permaculture for quite some time and uh, I, and you're one of the, the figureheads within that. And I know that you're a teacher where, where did you grow up and how did you, how did you, what's the, the sequence here that has enabled you to do the work that you're doing now? Sure. I grew up in Southeastern Pennsylvania, Chester County, outside of Philadelphia. I often characterize my upbringing as being raised Quaker. Uh, Quakers don't wear the funny hat like the person on the Quaker Oats box. Quakers are not Mennonites. They are not Amish. They consider the Bible to be a historical document of the times and not the word of God. They are uh, very anti-formal, anti-military, anti-violence. They are the originators of consensus decision-making process. That is who Thomas Paine, who wrote Common Sense in the Age of Reason. He is also a person who was raised Quaker in in Philadelphia area. And I hearken back to his philosophy. I really appreciate Thomas Paine. He's somebody who is also actively talking about how we can transform society through a more inclusive set of values. And being raised in that tradition, what's relevant about it to the thread of my practice in permaculture is that, you know, Quakers sit around in silence in a room that has no ornamentation whatsoever. And if they feel like standing up and saying something, they do. There's no minister, there's no preacher, there's no um, strange blood cult going on on the walls or anything. And so it's refreshingly zen, I realized, because I went on after I went to what I call a school for freaks, hippies, dropouts, and artists, uh, which is kind of my crowd that I like being around people who are creatives and imaginative. And as I realized going to a school, it was called Upatina's. 
because the school started at Tina's house, which was up the hill. By the time I went to it in the 80s, it was in a very nice big field stone mansion that had become a boys school that also had a big gym. And so we had a really nice campus and the school was formative because the school had no grades, no credit. And you still got a state certified high school diploma because we satisfied four English, three science, three math, three social studies. The reason I know all that is I went on after college to teach there for 10 years. The school closed after 43 years of operation because of what's called founder syndrome, which if you've heard of that, it was a very common pattern that many nonprofits in the United States that were started in the 70s by oftentimes liberal minded radicals uh, gave a huge amount of their personal time to a fault, the founders did. And this created founder syndrome as a pattern throughout the country for many nonprofits that were started in the 70s because really once those founders aged out, they had made themselves irreplaceable financially because they had given too much. And so Upatina's basically fizzled and disappeared after 43 years of operation when Sandra Hurst, who had become the director both when I was a student there and was the director for the decade long career I had there creating what I call ecological literacy educational programming, and it was while I was at Upatina's in the 90s that I studied permaculture design at the farm in Tennessee, one of the larger hippie communes now called Intentional Communities uh, in the country. I was started by Stephen Gaskin, Nina May Gaskin. Stephen was a metaphysics professor at Berkeley who was traveling around in buses following the Grateful Dead. And he had thousands of hippies following him. And they finally decided in Summertown, Tennessee to buy 1,600 acres and start a commune on it with 1,200 people living there. And they didn't understand basic hygiene, so a lot of people got giardia and other illnesses from not doing a good job of upkeeping their outhouses. <clears throat> and then fast forward to the 90s, the farm has 200 people on it because they went in debt. And Stephen Nina May said, anybody who can't help pay off the debt has to leave. So that called it from 1,200 to 200 on 1,600 acres of land. They now also have this thing called the Swan Land Trust where they doubled their acreage. So they now have more like 3,600 acres of land down there in Summertown, Tennessee. And uh, Albert Bates is an environmental lawyer who was a heavy anti-nuke activist. And he started a program at the farm called the Eco Village Training Center. And that's where I studied permaculture in 1996. I always have this little prop here, won't help with your radio audience, but permaculture activist is the place where I learned how to understand what permaculture is with Peter Bain, Chuck Marsh, Patricia Allison, and Andrew Goodhart Brown to lean, you know, to name my lineage. Those are my teachers. They're East Coast people. So by 1996, I'd been teaching at Upatina's for about six years at that point. Well, more like five years, because I started in 91. I graduated from college about 89, 90. And I went to Guilford College, a Quaker school, and I studied comparative religions there and graduated with a major in comparative religions, a concentration in history. Little relevant background, when I was in high school, I had a private tutor in Latin and ancient Greek for three years running. And so I learned a lot about ancient history. And when I studied permaculture, what I really liked about it is that it actually addresses a bunch of issues of the industrial modern era that we're in as well as issues that have been going on for thousands of years in landscape mismanagement. And I found that to be a very heartening vision, a vision that is about solving systemic problems that both go back over a long time period, as well as addressing near-term, very volatile and critical issues of the modern age that are unprecedented in human history. And I was very inspired by the scope of what permaculture addresses and takes on as a historian, as a teacher. I incorporated it into my curriculum and created the Center for Bioregional Living in 1998 at Upatina's, where I was taking kids out in a bus to go work on organic farms, biodynamic farms. That's how I learned biodynamics, because I wanted to add it to my repertoire, because I found that 
permaculture, well, it does a lot when you think of the land application to really encourage us to explore this method called forest gardening, which is this idea of creating a cultivated landscape that it looks more like a wild ecology, which you can get a good synergy of yields from that you won't get from a wild ecology and you won't get from something that's a monoculture. So permaculture is big into polyculture, perennial forest garden ecosystems. I'd always tell my students, if you understand that concept, you've got one of the core concepts of permaculture, polyculture in contrast to monoculture, perennial to balance out the over dependence that we have on, oh, I think it's about four annuals that provide 60% of the world's food right now. So we're talking about soy, GMO soy, rice, GMO corn, and, uh, you know, and what's the other I'm forgetting here? Rice, corn, soy, wheat, and wheat. Right. Thank you. Four crops, 60% of the world's food, all annuals. And permaculture's saying, well, let's let the pendulum swing back a little bit more to the middle. We've gone way too far down this rabbit hole, depending on annuals, because why are we thinking perennials are a good direction? Because once they're established, you don't have to reestablish them every single year. We're not saying you throw out the baby with the bathwater and get rid of annuals. But what permaculture is saying is that a lot of the mistakes of past civilizations that caused their demise had to do with deforestation. So what permaculture is caught on to that's a really sharp idea is it's saying, hey, if we can get this society to get excited about tree crops, which is a book written in 1924 by J. Russell Smith that Bill Mollison and David Holmgren borrowed a great deal of precedent setting research that J. Russell Smith did in tree crops in 1924. That book basically established that European chestnuts, hickories, walnuts, as well as a whole array of plants and trees that Russell Smith was recommending for fodder for livestock would do a better job yield per acre than corn. And the main thing that Smith was going to bat against was king corn in the 20s was already rearing its head in Kentucky and other parts of the United States. And so he, as a professor of geography at Columbia University, created a whole new science that's called physiography. Physiography is the combination of physical geology and geography. And you can get degrees in this discipline. It's called physiographic provinces. Then in the 70s, that same word became bioregions. Then in the 90s, that same word became ecoregions. So we have three different terms for the same thing. It starts out in the 20s, physiographic provinces, becomes bioregions in the 70s, morphs into ecoregions, which is how the EPA and the DEP and conservation groups talk about them. Now, a unique part of what I've been doing is two things, thinking a lot about how do we really have, how do we teach people something that really empowers them to have a different understanding of what success is in the world today? How can we redefine success in terms of where we actually are? And what I mean by that is recognizing that we are on a planet in outer space circling a sun that has very defined empirical constraints to design. It's 24,901 miles in circumference. It's 70% ocean. It's 30% land. One of the things that's waiting to feed all of us is the ocean. Once we stop turning it into a toilet bowl and a trash heap, it would be a great place to sustain most of the world's people. In fact, I've found over time researching this, recently reading a book by Stephen Kellert called Birthright, where he's talking about nature deficit disorder. Kellert is a professor at Yale. And you know, what he cited was a study in a book called World Biodiversity by Gombridge that in fact, still the majority of the world's protein comes from wild caught seafood. In fact, it outstrips all land-based forms of protein combined. So if you took all the awful, noxious stuff that nobody should be eating in the first place that comes from factory farmed cattle and factory farmed chickens, right? Factory farmed pigs, you would find that more protein still comes from the ocean, which is astounding to me when you realize how much time we spend frittering about 
what we're doing on the land, which is important. We need to get it right, what we're doing on the land. Yet the elephant in the middle of the room is the ocean. And we're very rarely paying attention to it and saying, hmm, I wonder if as humans, we could come up with cooperative behaviors that actually improve the capacity for the ocean to provide us with a free lunch. And so I like to bring perspective into conversations that I find is often lacking around questions like food security, right? You'll have people thinking, well, we should all become vegan because there's not enough food for people. Well, there's two problems with that presupposition. One, there is an excess of this noxious, toxic stuff that people call food, but shouldn't rightly linguistically be labeled the same thing because there's food. And then there's stuff that's actually hazardous waste for your body and the planet. And that is this stuff that we use a misnomer for that we call food, but chemical industrial products are not fit for human consumption. So don't, don't believe the hype when it comes to what it is that you can just buy over the counter and thinking that that's something that's okay. You have to think for yourself vigilantly. And that's part of why I'm a big fan of meditation, contemplation, and introspection, because that's what helps you to think for yourself. There's a lot of propaganda. There's a lot of programming. And a big part of what I learned over my upbringing and what brought me to permaculture is that it's a real tool for self-empowerment, for communities to become more independent in a world that has been getting more and more centralized and industrialized. And I see those as type one errors in design when it comes to civilization infrastructure, meaning many previous civilizations before us collapsed because of centralized food supply systems, centralized distribution technologies. And so if we look at industrial food, we can see that it is something that everybody who studies hunger and starvation and malnutrition in the world is going to tell you that we have a wretched excess of industrial food. What happens is over a third of it gets wasted before it ever makes it to a point of consumption because of how wretched the excess is of the industrial means of production. They basically let lots of stuff just get destroyed in the field, get destroyed on the trucks or not bought at the supermarket. So the notion that by becoming vegan, you actually help hunger is erroneous and uninformed, but a very common and appropriate ethical response to a broken economy and to a broken food system. I've certainly practiced both vegetarianism and vegan at points in my life. And I have found that over time, my awareness of how to produce food in a more holistic and ecological way has moved me away from diet choices that are extremist and more towards diet choices that are realist. And when we live in a very technocratic, highly urbanized society, it's easy for individuals to get disconnected from reality when it comes to how do we provide for ourselves in a manner that actually makes holistic design sense? What does it mean to be a good human on this planet today? is something that actually we have to do some homework and thinking about and strategizing about. So in 1999, I decided to go build my permaculture PhD project, which is an off-grid homestead in Pocahontas County, West Virginia, on 17 and a half acres. And part of how I picked that property there was because it was near a project that I was doing design work for, which is called the Gesundheit Institute. And that was started by Patch Adams. Hollywood made a film about Patch just called Patch, where Robin Williams plays him. And he's a doctor who heals with sure. love and humor. Patch is a real world person who, when you meet him, it does feel like you're meeting somebody who's stepping out of a Hollywood film. He's very charismatic. He's an incredible public speaker. He can quote stuff like T.S. Eliot's Wasteland from beginning to end. He's a very uh, Renaissance kind of person who, again, a bunch of people followed to a commune that he started on 325 acres in West Virginia that he called Gesundheit, right? His brother, Wildman, runs another commune that's in 
what they call it the rocks. It's in the northern part of West Virginia. And Gesundheit was where I first was hired full time as a permaculture consultant to look at Dave Sellers designs for a free hospital that Patch wants to build there. And to also do things like when volunteers came there who were medical students, give them something other than a weed eater and a lawnmower to be occupied with. So I created gardening programs there. I created a permaculture master plan and design for the 325 acre property. Meanwhile, 40 minutes away, I was building my straw bale off grid, gravity fed from springs homestead to cut my teeth on things that my teachers in 96 had waxed poetic about, which is natural building, right? Natural building was kind of the foundation of what it is that brought me to the next level of understanding what this discipline of permaculture has to offer when it comes to the brass tacks of a different way of doing things as far as infrastructure, buildings, water, energy. It's very place-based. It's very human scale. And what I was doing with my homestead there was exploring, could I build a year round, nice winterized house out of as many on-site materials possible, right? So I used black locust posts from the property for a pole barn foundation. Pole barn, I still have people who, when I post things on social networks today will say, well, what are you doing for the footing of that building? I'm like the same thing people did 200 years ago for barns that you see that are now standing and doing fine, which is not using concrete, right? (laughs) What I do is I follow traditional methods that have worked for hundreds of years, rather than thinking just because you can buy it at a box store, you should dump it into a post hole. I also do a lot of consultation design and walking land, which I'll, I'll get into here. But to give you a sense of the experiential base that I then built upon to create where I am today, it is important to understand that creating and taking eight years to build an off-grid homestead is part of why I have more street cred than any other teacher who moved into New York City had before me. And that was part of why when I moved to New York City about 14 years ago, I was able to hit the ground running with my partner, Adriana Magana, who is a great promoter, great graphic artist, and a very well-known musician who was part of a band that was called Crash Worship, that were some of the first kind of real radical out Burning Man-esque before Burning Man existed style music performances that she was part of. So she really understood music, really understands promotion, studied permaculture, and helped me in my career and is the mother of my daughter. And we live together here in Ellenville with the three of us, Juniper, who is 11 now. And yeah, I never looked back. I mean, I left my homestead in West Virginia because Nobody was coming there to study with me in the numbers that I wanted to teach them. And I'd learned all I wanted to learn about natural building, off-grid water, rotational grazing of heritage breed livestock. I was keeping American milking devons there that I was raising and also heritage breed chickens that I was rotational grazing, doing all of the gardening with hand tools and then selling to high-end restaurants like the Greenbrier River Hotel and having a farmer's market stand where I was doing the classic of selling kombucha, selling sourdough bread, selling arugula for $14 a pound to high-end restaurants that I was growing all with hand tools with gravity-fed spring water, never drilled a well, never got grid tie, ran the entire project with thousands and thousands of gallons of buried underground tanks that I was bringing on to the site so that all winter I didn't need the spring lines to flow at all. And how would you capture the water? What's that? What, what would be the intake to capture the water? The spring. So Got the it. springs were higher than the tanks and the tanks were higher than the house. So what I was able to do in the springs were damp, muddy spots when I found them. So what I did first was dug them up, turned them into a reservoir, stuck a pipe through the dam that made it a reservoir, put a screen on the pipe, ran the pipe through the woods to the tanks, buried the tanks below frost line, and then buried a line that came from the tanks below frost line to an insulated column in the house that came up and did 
all the water, all winter long, frost free from 3,000 gallons of spring water that was stored. So what I learned there were a lot of things about how much you can do with a damp, muddy spot in the middle of the woods, right? I basically learned that you can take a spring and you can run an entire home, you can run an entire farm, and that all it has to do with is storage and thinking through the volume that you need to store and what your constraints are on that given site, right? What's your, when's your first frost? When's your last frost? How long are you going to need to have that water that is in those tanks being what you're providing for your household system. Can we jump in there? Yeah. And and pa- and ladies and gentlemen that are listening, the, one half a prompt of question for Andrew, of where do you come from? Expose this like beautiful narrative with so many different points that we could jump into. But you raised, you're raising this example of spring fed water system. And you're talking about natural building that gave you the credibility and in, in moving to Brooklyn. And that's where I'm, I'm curious your perspective on where humanity is at. It's like, we're so far removed from knowing that water comes from somewhere instead of the tap. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have no more barn raising. So we don't realize that uh, right. footings can be in anything other than concrete. Mm-hmm. And that's what I'm, I'm trying to wonder is like, is our civilization able to evolve into under, having a mass adoption of an ecological literacy to make those kinds of adjustments in their own living situations, their own environments? Or is this something that we've just, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, are we at right. the last leg of our civilization, like Meg Wheatley says? And, well, it's a, it's a great question. And I could see how you might think if we stopped the storyline there, it seems like they're incommensurate. How can you translate what I was doing on my homestead to a megalopolis like NYC, right? The five boroughs. Well, what I did that was very inspiring for me as a designer was I basically immersed myself in the stats, data, and demographics of the boroughs as a permaculture designer to think about the very question you're asking, how can we take something like a high density urban environment? There's eight and a half million people that the subway delivers transportation to in New York City. There's 20 million people in the greater metropolitan area. So I looked at it as a great design assignment. I looked at New York City and I still look at it. It's still where the bulk of my students come from because a lot of what I've developed since living off the grid really has very little to do with living off the grid when it comes to what I teach in my classes. Now, what I'm teaching in New York City with thousands of graduates 13 years, 14 years later, um, the reason people study with me in New York is because of what I learned through my analysis, assessment, and design process for one of the largest cities in the world. And what I did was I looked at New York City as an urban metabolism. And you'll hear this term used a lot in green design for cities, urban metabolisms. And what that's talking about is saying, what are the inflows? What are the outflows? How do you start to keep them from just being something where cities are kind of hemorrhages of assets and hemorrhages of resources with crazy pollution legacies downstream from them and turn them into something that actually has a restorative, regenerative, beneficial relationship to outlying areas and downstream. And that to me seemed like a worthy design assignment to take on. And what I found was that there's a lot of opportunities to turn around the industrial petropolis. One of my favorite books on this is called uh, Creating Regenerative Cities by Herbert Gerardet. This book really furthered my inspiration after having already come up with a lot of insights and ideas about how we can, and get ready for a lot of words here, retrofit the infrastructure to be more regionally self-reliant in ways that are ecologically sound, socially responsible, and prosperous, right? So what I'm doing there is I'm taking the triple bottom line of sustainable economics, which is ecology, economy, society, 
And you take those and you say, all right, that's a cool concept, but could we land the plane? What does that look like? Right. And that's the part that I find is still largely lacking. There's not a lot of literature, not a lot of good maps or designs that actually articulate on a regional planning scale, which is something that I'll get more into here because that's become my focus much more than things like designing a self-sufficient homestead in a wilderness area in West Virginia. That was a really important learning experience for me to then be able to take the concepts and the experiences that I'd learned in that environment and translate them to a high density urban environment and to give me the confidence that these things worked. I knew now that they worked at a personal visceral level and that gave me the confidence and inspiration to say, there must be a way that we can work out how to redesign cities, right? It's 50% it's it's of the world's population lives in cities. And I've been kind of since I've moved to Brooklyn and been thinking about how to retrofit the infrastructure of urban environments. I've also been poking a little bit of fun at my colleagues because basically most permaculture doesn't even bother with trying to redesign cities. They, the message ipso facto of most of the permaculture community is abandon them, let them die. The industrial era is just going to collapse and then we're all going to do permaculture. I often joke in my classes, it's like as if post-collapse, people are going to run to us and the Amish and ask us what to do. That's great. But are we relevant now? <laughs> and to me, being relevant now to, to the majority of the world's people as designers is important. And so how to redesign New York City? You know, New York City has, well, here's a fun uh, analysis that was done in New York by, you know, Lester R. Brown and the World Watch Institute. So Lester Brown, they're an important uh, watchdog organization. They do reports that are called State of the World Reports, where what they do is they look at all the major demographics of what's going on with air quality, water quality, uh, quality of life, health issues globally. And they put out this very depressing state of the world report every year. Lester Brown said, well, since plan A isn't working, what's plan B? And in plan B, he articulates and he uses New York City as a model for his analysis. And he says, here's one thing to consider about New York City. We've got 12,000 tons of trash that are hauled out every single day, 900 tractor trailer rigs hauling out that trash. And if we simply got food out of trash, we would be able to cut the number of tractor trailer rigs driving out of New York City by at least a third, possibly up to half. So now instead of 900, you're at somewhere like 600 to 500 tractor trailer rigs just by doing one thing, getting food out of trash. So a major focus of our classes is starting entrepreneurial businesses that address issues that are right now not being addressed at the government level or at the corporate level and require small business enterprises to step in in this vacuum in between policymakers and grassroots demand for change, right? There's a lot, there's here where we are in the Northeastern United States, I also like to, to just for our conversation, I always like to scale up the framework. I'm not just thinking about New York City. I'm thinking about the entire Northeastern Corridor, which is 120 million people, and it's over a third of the U.S. population. So if you look at, if you look at Baltimore, D.C., Philadelphia, New York City, and Boston, and you look at all the outlying areas, you're talking about over a third of the U.S. population that lives there. And so I look at that as my design assignment since that's where I live. And so when you look at all of those people and you say, how about if we advocate for railroads? How about if we get food out of trash? How about if we create an overall regional master plan that is about improving air quality, improving water quality, improving resilience, creating green jobs? And so a major focus of our program is to train up people in what I call green careers. It's like a green careers vocational training in a sense, even though our real focus is design, right? Every one of our graduates does an individual design assignment in order to graduate from our class. That's a unique curriculum adjustment that I made on most permaculture design certification courses. We'll have people do group design for the same site 
well, it ends up making that actual activity in the class less productive than it could be because it's much more productive to have 25 people do individual designs for individual sites because now you've got 25 different versions of permaculture being applied to 25 different sites. And what you have is each individual student now feeling inspired, empowered, and ready to go as far as being part of the solution, creating an enterprise for themselves, transitioning their job. A lot of our students are people who are wanting to do a career change. And so my focus has been on this idea of training up an entrepreneurial sector who feel inspired and informed enough to begin to step out with our mentoring, because we mentor all, all of our graduates for several years or longer, but we agree to at least a two-year mentorship for all of our graduates. Hey, everybody, this is Neil. We are going to get back to this great conversation in just one second. But I think it's fair to say that right now, we are facing some pretty unprecedented challenges in the 21st century. I mean, you name it, environmentally, socially, economically, we've got some big problems that we need to overcome. And that's why for me personally, and the people that work with us at Latitude, we want to dedicate our time and our energy so that we are not only working to put food on the table and a roof over our heads, but also make the world a better place. And so if you are at all interested in combining your sustainability values with a very powerful financial model of real estate, then I highly encourage you to check out what we are doing at Latitude. We are creating something truly special with a tribe of change agents that for now is working across North America. And hopefully one day in the future with you coming on board, we can be working across the globe. So please check us out. You can go to www.chooselatitude.com or you can find us on social media at latitude.realty on Instagram and we are also on Facebook. Okay, let's get back into it. Another unique thing I've been doing here is doing a weekend format class in the same place for 13 or 14 years is very different. Most PDCs, I'm going to use the acronym now, are a shorter format. They're a 12-day class and they will often be at a remote site. So if you think about that, demographically, what you're talking about is a phenomenon that is a, it's kind of a splash in the pan phenomenon because what you end up with is you've got now 12, 30 people who all went to Costa Rica. They took a permaculture design course. They go back to Manhattan, Sacramento, and Boston. They have no idea how to translate what they learned in that 12-day class in Costa Rica to Manhattan or Sacramento or Boston. Right. But by actually being right in the belly of the beast and teaching how you do it here, we're actually bringing permaculture to the people who are going to then be able to continue to collaborate with each other. Right. So what we're doing is markedly different because of the fact that we're doing a weekend format class, because we're staying in the same geography. We are training up a grassroots base of people who can really take it to that next level and get our tutelage in how to go about doing that. That's really interesting because the, the green career section that I've, I think is touted by the government a lot and by the media is that, oh, we're going to train people on how to go build windmills and install solar panels. This is yes. a completely different multidimensional look at, at design. Yep. And, and you've redesigned the design curriculum, which... Exactly. You know, I, I hope people can can understand the the importance and the uniqueness of that approach because it's certainly not something that you come across very often. And yeah, I mean, you, your aim at New York City is one of the the biggest metropolises of the world, and it's like, okay, here's how we are able to to reconceive of it, as well as an economic activity of let's train entrepreneurial thought leaders and, and mm -hmm. doers. Yep. What are some of the examples that have come out of that, of small scale solutions that, that people have implemented there? One is, one that I wanna share that isn't exactly small scale solutions, and then I'll get to answering that question, but a very important focus of ours has been in film. 
in training people who are good filmmakers in how to tell the story of permaculture. And what we mean by the story is our version of it, which is the version that talks about redesigning the entire infrastructure, not simply a version that's about taking you on a tour of a glam show of a bunch of beautiful gardens and sites. That's great. But at the end of the day, films that do that are basically sending a message to the audience that says, if you want to do this, you have to start a farm and you have to have a garden. Well, actually, you don't. All you have to do is care and be conscientious and selective about what you buy, how you live, and what it is that you're contributing to and participating in. Permaculture isn't about some product. It's not about these things that you create. It's a process of design. It's a means of analysis. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of understanding the world. So to me, film has been a really important transformative educational tool that as teachers in New York City, we purposefully did barter exchanges and created beneficial relationships with people who wanted to study with us who we knew were good filmmakers. And that is part of what created Inhabit and has created many other short films that you'll see on our websites, on our YouTubes. Um, one, of, one of the people that really loves our material is called Films for Action. And we're, four of my films are on what they call the top 100 best documentaries. That's and that's because we're really focusing on this idea that permaculture isn't just this kind of like backyard boutique gardening thing. It's actually a way that we can comprehensively and collaboratively redesign our entire system to actually be a system that is by the people and for the people. And as to what that looks like, we can also go down to the nuts and bolts of it. And that's what's unique about our training program and our consultation services, that we're able to take a big picture concept, like redesigning our whole industrial economy, and bring it down to earth and say, that's why we need to have a green job vocational training center right here. That's how we're going to go food independent and energy independent in the Rondout Valley watershed, which is my latest case study that I'm doing films about, that then I can share films with audiences all over the world who are interested in this idea of transitioning from an industrial economy to an ecological economy. And it does come down to economy at the end of the day when we think about how can we advocate for a, a more inclusive beneficial way of doing things and living. It is a very important communication tool. I mean, arguably filmmakers are the mythologists of our modern age. And that isn't something that I have any dislike for whatsoever. In fact, quite the contrary, it's something that I think makes the field of myth-making much more accessible to a broader spectrum of people. And so there's first that thing of getting out the vision and getting the vision to be more broad scope to happen through this storytelling of film. And then what was the other part of your question? <laughs> uh, it, just examples of, of what has come out of that. It, oh, examples. It, yeah. Thank you. Some brass tacks are we have a graduate who runs a building team now that's built four straw bale houses up here for clients. and. We have a nice active crew of people who are, we, you know, we do, I do a lot of property analysis for people who just find my website and ask me to walk land for them and kind of kick the tires on it and tell them if I think it's good for what they want to do. And a good percentage of those clients then ask us to build houses for them. And so then when we do that, we are implementing building technologies that are informed by my experience in building and natural construction. And my business partner, Jeff Gagnon, who's a graduate of the program, is a very talented designer and builder. And typically the process is that I'll meet the client, I'll walk the land, and I'll pitch a certain kind of building concept to them, like slab on grade, solar thermal hot water into the slab, non-load bearing straw bale, southern exposure with earthen floors. And then when the client says, great, I want a slab on grade, solar thermal into the slab, non-load bearing straw bale with earthen plasters, southern exposed, then 
we go into the details of actually designing their particular domicile, right? So one success, one evidence is our natural building crew and our natural building portfolio. The other is, I'd say more like we have a nice broad spectrum of people who have started enterprises that are what you might imagine, retreat centers, yoga centers, uh, herbalists, um, you know, um, homeschool education centers, and uh, as, as well as um, textiles and sustainable fashion. We've had a good, good number of people who've studied sustainable fashion at Pratt and other programs in the city who then studied with us who are using. So a lot of our students are, people are, many, many of them are quite sophisticated or skilled already. We have a lot of students who are architects, who are landscape architects. We have a good number who are engineers, urban planners. And so when they study with us, they basically just take what they learn from us and integrate it into their already existing disciplines. So yeah, we have that so range cool. of people who get into natural building, people who get into herbalism and retreat centers and the food and beverage organizations. We have people who start restaurants. And then we have people who are just synthesizing it with their already existing careers. Wow. Yeah. I, and I think having that regenerative design lens in whatever vocation people are in is going to be really helpful. Uh, we actually had a natural builder named Oliver Ogden that created a, a company out here in Portland called Placecraft that mm -hmm. he ended up moving to Brooklyn, got into filmmaking and was doing a film on uh, kind of like the, the San County Almanac oh, yeah. of Brooklyn and then ended up moving down to the Carolinas and got into natural building. And now he's a natural builder. And I've also known natural builders that have gone into filmmaking mm -hmm. and that's their, their medium. So there's a lot of really interesting connection points to that story. Yeah. I mean, with natural building, what I've been finding is you really need to have places that teach people that, I mean, another place where I've been teaching for oh, 13 years is this place. Yes, tomorrow. Yes, tomorrow. Yeah. Started by Yale and MIT architects. That's basically, we have been the people who created the first certificate program that they ever offered, which is the permaculture design certification course 14 years ago or plus. Um, it's the longest running PDC program that I've been teaching. It's the one at Yes, tomorrow. And I've helped them create a lot of curriculum now that they offer as their own, which is a sustainable design build certificate program, where they, they took our innovative version of permaculture curriculum and used it for the first half of their sustainable design build certificate. And the second half is their core program, which is a home design build program, which is what they really started by with John Connell and Kenny Connell at the time. They created Yestermar really to help lay people feel like they could design and build their own house. And so they found me in West Virginia and saw what I was doing and said, you're the perfect person to bring permaculture to yes tomorrow because you really understand building infrastructure, energy, water systems. And we want to have a permaculture class that is sophisticated in its knowledge of building systems and energy systems, but also really understands gardening, farming and the more land based end of permaculture, because that was the new material that they wanted to bring in but they really wanted to be sure they had somebody who had that solid grounding in knowing how to do good home design as well as good land design, right? So Yestermarl is basically the only place I know of in the country that really does natural building programs. There are very, very few. You'll find little mom and pop enterprises that offer a summer class in cob building, right? But these guys have a whole catalog. They've got an online it's all building, right? So they are basically the only place I know of that's a 501c3 that just focuses full-time on doing nothing but training people in building, energy, plumbing, all the different nuts and bolts of what goes into home design build yeah, projects. Yeah, impressive. There's an impressive lineup of educators and board members there that right. some have been but, on, on this show. and So long story to... short, we need more of them. There just aren't enough places like that, you know, and these guys are not super financially accessible. There's nothing cheap about yes, tomorrow classes, right? So there's, so there's both this kind of 
high end niche that they actually cater to in order for them to survive as a business enterprise. And at the same time, there's this broader social and ecological need that we have to roll this stuff out a lot more actively than we are right now in this country. Um, and just like you said, around renewable energy, it's another big one that we need to have training programs that aren't just about huge solar arrays, huge wind farms, HVAC systems, geothermal heat pumps, and this, uh, my latest least favorite are net zero and passive house, right? These things are noxious to natural builders and are a health hazard to the people who end up living in them. Because Let's talk about that. You know, the thing about the thing that that is that is hard for people who want to do the right thing to understand about paying somebody to build them a passive house that's heated and cooled with geothermal heat pumps and splits and grid tied solar is that they don't really have a lot of other alternatives they can find. So I want to be clear when I critique this, I'm not disparaging people for making that kind of purchase choice. It's more a comment on the marketplace and the business community in this country. And what I mean by that is we're woefully under diverse when it comes to who is positioned as a contractor, as a builder, as a designer to offer a buyer anything different, right? It's like, you, you could, I, it comes across as disingenuous if I'm in a slice and dice passive house and net zero houses and then not acknowledge that in fact the people who are buying those are really genuinely for the most part trying to do the right thing right and it and it who who do i i will say who does deserve the criticism are the architects the contractors built they do warrant a little criticism because what they end up doing is not thinking out of the box they just buy into the typical financial constraints of all design endeavors and they don't do anything that stretches the envelope very much at all. And they're just pitching a package. I mean, do you know what they're charging to build passive house here? You probably don't. 400 a square foot for passive house here, right? And we just quoted a client to build a straw bale house at 350 a square foot. Now, are they, they are apples and oranges when it comes to comparables, you know, which is the apple and which the, I think probably our place is the apple because <laughs> that's more appropriate to the Hudson value. You know, and the orange is more the passive house where you've got this, it's what in permaculture design we call plop and drop, where you're just like, oh, we're just going to plop and drop some elements in the land, check the boxes and we're good. It's eco. And well, wait a minute. Could we actually spend a little bit more time on some analysis about each step of that product that you plopped into the landscape? You know, for instance, if you just looked at the carbon footprint and the ecological impact of making zips panels making HVAC systems, making photovoltaic panels, you'd start to find that a building like that is very unlikely to offset its own ecological impact during its use of a lifetime, right? Plus, you're talking about materials that off-gas a huge amount of volatile organic compounds into the air of the home that, if the HEPA filter doesn't work, are toxifying the inhabitants of it. And it's utterly dependent on the grid because it's grid tied. So, if, and it sends this message to the person who's living in the home that it's okay to design homes where everything runs on electric. Well, there are certain types of things that make sense to run on electric, lights, um, computers, music, right? But does it make sense to heat your home with electric? Does it make sense to cook with electric. And what you'll find is that these two forms of generating energy, when you want to generate heat, when you want to generate a fuel that you can cook with, you'll find that electric is a very, very high order of energy that takes very sophisticated technologies to create. But if you look at heat, heat is actually a type of energy that can be created by all kinds of low orders of work. It doesn't take a high order of work to create heat. And when you use electricity to create heat, you're taking a very sophisticated, complex technology to do actually a very mundane and low order of work that can be done by a huge pile of wood chips you could heat your house with. Uh, the thing I'm particularly excited about is potentially incorporating into our passive solar 
straw bale, non-load bearing, solar thermal. See, in solar thermal, it's also something I'm more a fan of than photovoltaic, and it's largely unheard of in this country. Yet, interestingly, in China, 600,000 people are employed creating solar thermal technology. Here's some interesting numbers for you. Over a third of all the homes in China get all of their hot water from solar thermal panels. That's basically the entire US population, right? Because we've got a billion people in China, take a third of those people. You're talking about the entire US getting all their hot water from a technology that we still barely even talk about or understand. Well, that's because the technocrats, the contractors, and the bureaucrats aren't at all familiar with solar thermal. All they understand is huge grid tied solar arrays and huge wind farms and huge mega hydro projects. But are those resilient? Do those offer the capacity to recover from major climactic storm events as rapidly as a more regionally appropriate, diverse, and integrated renewable set of technologies? No, they don't at all. But nobody uses words like diverse, resilient, and appropriate when they talk about renewables. And that's an important part of our lexicon culturally that we want to start to bring in is saying, well, what does it look like to make appropriate versions of a renewable energy retrofit? Not simply just thinking that it's somehow eco to have something that's called net zero. Net, net zero what? It's not zero ecological impact. It's not zero carbon footprint. Those things actually we could measurably say are quite high for these fancy high-end private homes that are getting built for numbers like $400 a square foot, right? So- If not higher. Yeah, if not higher. So yeah. it's, it, it, to me, it's like, a, it's a transition technology. It's okay, it's less bad, but it's by no stretch of the imagination what it's being purported to be. How does that fit in with- the idea of retrofitting, especially if you're looking at the metropolises like New York City, I mean, we're not. Yeah. Well, so with retrofitting, the best thing to do is to cut down on the need for energy in the first place. So you max out passive systems before you get into active systems. What that means in the city is extensive green roofs all over the landscape. And New York City got hip to this after Chicago went full steam ahead with green roof initiatives that were tax incentivized. It's passive because what it does is it mitigates urban heat island effect. And if you look at urban heat island effect, you will find that it is one of the worst pollution problems in our city centers. What that is referring to is the fact that when cities get too hot, you get this crazy level of air pollution just hanging around in the city air and you end up with people spending extra energy and the power plants. New York City still generates 70% of its electricity burning fuel oil inside of the city. So what you end up with is you have exacerbated air pollution because everybody's cranking on their air conditioners, right? So you get this feedback cascade effect in the summertime of the city having awful air quality, huge pollution load, massive storm events, because that's part of how uh, clouds respond to increased particulate load as they, they have deposition of rainfall that's like much, much harder and more intense because now they have all of this particulate that they're globbing their rain molecules onto and just dousing the city in massive rainfall events. So you get all these cascade effects that make everybody in New York leave for most of the summer, right? New York City is known to have an exodus of New Yorkers from July to September people leave in large numbers. And it's because the city is markedly unpleasant. You don't even have to know all these data points to just know, yuck, let's leave the city in the summer, right? So it turns out this one simple thing, extensive green roofs being tax incentivized has a huge systemic quality of life improvement effect on New York City and other urban environments that have rainwater pollution issues, because the other thing that green roofs help to alleviate from the top down, right? So when you think about with urban landscapes, where is our place to intercept a problem like combined sewer overflows, which we have 24 billion gallons of in New York City, 24 billion gallons of raw, untreated industrial waste, stormwater drains and sewage being just released into all the estuary and ecologies around the five boroughs. And one of the best ways to alleviate that is green roofs. So you've got, so green roofs all of a sudden become this real important go-to as a first implementation 
measure to systemically improve with passive natural living systems problems like air quality and water quality. Well, and there's that great example in the movie and and have it of the the Brooklyn Brooklyn Urban Farm or Brooklyn Grange. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Um, beautiful. That project. was part of how I picked and pointed things for Costa to highlight in that film was so that people would come away for with it with some of the key important takeaways that we've learned through this decade of studying the urban environment are really yeah. really useful details to draw people's attention to uh, so we can, make, we can make cities a lot nicer and and we should be and it, we it, should we should yes. be it's an important it's an important should to put on our list even though shoulds are something to be careful of um it absolutely is an imperative that we improve air quality improve water quality and simultaneously start to enforce the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. But if we're, so in an urban environment like that, a tactical measure, put it on green roofs, we're still not getting away from high VOC levels and in internal environments. Uh, the VOC. heating source, the fueling source for cooking. Right. You know, like, is there, have you thought through that, that adaptive, retrofitting scenario of of just beyond lowering the the energy needs sure i mean a huge part of it is about a regional plan that creates city to country fingers of what we might call agro ecotourism opportunities so that you begin to have corridors of growth that are specifically planned that encourage like they do around amsterdam like they do around Stockholm, like they do around Berlin, like they do around Shanghai, where we begin to say, well, how about if we have a regional master plan where we tax incentivize green corridors around high density urban areas so that we can have more full diet year round food supply coming from within a reasonable distance of the city center. Right. And we don't just let sprawl and business as usual and the free market define what happens with land development, we actually have numbers that we've done to show how much area of what type of soil and what type of geography do we need in order to go food independent in the Northeastern Corridor. Now, maybe not all crops are going to make sense to do that with, but we can start with things like lettuce, arugula, and then we can go for things like potatoes, corn, squash, dairy, meat products, right? You can begin to basically scale up and think about full diet year round omnivores delight. One of the studies I've been looking at is called a food vision for lower New England came out of University of New Hampshire. Very unique study because they're, they're doing this is a new term that's coming out there. It's called a food shed, right? We've heard the term watershed, but a food shed is talking about identifying where does all the food come from that any given population that you're doing the study for is consuming, you know? So one important food shed study done by a colleague of mine is called Feed Northampton. Lisa DePiano was the lead designer on that. She's a dear friend and colleague and permaculture educator who teaches at University of Massachusetts. And Lisa and I have also been co-creating the permaculture for regional planning curriculum that I teach at Yestermorrow. Specifically because of Yestermar's constituency, I created a more niche class that focuses on regional design applications of permaculture to attract urban planners, architects, and municipal employees to study this scaled up version of permaculture, where we look at food issues, energy issues, and waste issues, water issues, and transportation infrastructure. And we start to combine all those into a master plan. What is our regional master plan to address food security, energy security, address waste and water pollution issues, and begin to actually have something that creates long-term economic opportunities for local populations that are intergenerational? Let me ask Andrew, are you hopeful right now? Is it, you have so many good action-oriented uh, philosophies and, and I am. I'm, I'm hopeful because I often... I mean, really, philosophically, I feel like any of us who are doing well owe the world a degree of optimism. I don't think that it's helpful 
to indulge ourselves in pessimism and cynicism. I just see those as a privileged class tendency that feels psychologically secure, but is ultimately socially irresponsible. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> I mean, I just think it's important to frame it that way. One of my, uh, one of my friends here runs a whole community and he, and he, he did a, a whole talk, a whole lecture on optimistic nihilism which I really like that phrase because optimistic nihilism really gets at my philosophical position in the sense that, well, I have hope in a sense of positive outcomes for very real and tangible reasons, meaning I do see the interest in inclusive, better design, more earth-based, people-centered ways of doing things increasing. You know, I'm thankful for the change in the political atmosphere in this country. I'm fairly involved now, maybe in some ways more than I'd like to be in local politics. I'm the chair of our local Walworsing Democratic Committee. And I think it's important for permies to get involved in politics. And I think it's important for us to stay engaged in mainstream society and not forever using permaculture to go do our hermitage. I think the hermitage is important, but I think it's not the end game. Of permaculture. It definitely was not for me personally. Coming back down off of the mountains of West Virginia and back into the megalopoli landscape of the Northeastern Corridor was a very important way for me to get engaged with a meta level social process that I feel is inspiring and necessary for practitioners of permaculture who really want to create positive change. We need to stay engaged in society. We need to be engaged in our communities. And I find that my optimism comes from my participation in a broad spectrum of groups that I'm interacting with. I'm, I'm right now helping to start a group that's called the Rondout Creek Watershed Alliance. And so they are a nascent watershed group. I'm really big into watersheds as a framework for design where we first advocate for and help people have watershed literacy. Just important to recognize many people don't even realize they live in a watershed. Many people don't know what it is, right? So that you start with that, creating graphics, creating numbers and saying, hey, we live in the Rondout watershed, which is a drainage basin of 700,000 acres with 91,000 people in it. And we could go food independent by using 120,000 of those acres to grow all the food crops that those 90,000 people need. Those numbers come from that food vision for Lower New England. They estimated about 1.6 acres per person to go full diet year round omnivores to light food supply. So the more I get involved in groups, the more I see the opportunities for us to scale up these solution sets that, you know, for the last, say, 20, 30, 40 years, permaculture has really been largely, at least in the G20 nations, something that has been more attractive to individuals. It hasn't even gotten to the institutional level still. I mean, the fact that my colleague Lisa teaches at University of Massachusetts is a relatively new thing that we are seeing permaculture. She has a master's in urban planning as well. That's an important piece of obviously working at a university. What we found is that permaculture, if you looked at it demographically, you'd find it stayed in the private sector. It hasn't really bothered to move into the public sector. And it stayed very focused on the individual and individual properties and backyards. Those are important points of leverage, absolutely, and places to be focusing our attention and our energy. And then let's add to that, what do we want to advocate for in our greater community? And then what, I'm, what I find meaningful and useful is to say, how do we define what our community is? And to a degree, geography is part of how we want to define that. We all live in a watershed of some sort or another. And once we identify that as a kind of template that we can use as a design baseline to begin to configure some of our land use patterns around, we can then come up with land use activities that are more appropriate, more sustainable, more ecological. I'm also starting something that I call the Permaculture Living Land Trust, which we have state of New York 
nonprofit status for, and we're in the process of getting the federal status for. The reason we're creating that is because I've also been very closely involved in the world of conservation, land trusts, planning, going to planning board meetings, thinking about development. You know, growing up in Chester County, I saw a lot of sprawl happen during my boyhood years. I grew up in a landscape that went from fairly rural to fairly highly suburbanized. And that was also formative for me in the sense of giving me the understanding that if we don't come up with a better plan, that is going to continue to be what happens in areas as far as what we consider development. And I like to say it's not about growth or not growth, but it's about what do we want to grow, right? And we, want to, we don't want to get in this position of some kind of polemic where we're saying, oh, I'm for or I'm against this. But rather, the beauty of permaculture is it encourages us to articulate a vision of what we'd rather see in the world. And the more clear and compelling and beautiful your vision is, the more desirable and exciting and engaging it is for an audience that is hearing what it is that you're sharing. They're like, oh, wow, this really does make sense. It really is accessible. We really do need to think on a larger scale about what we're doing with land and what we're doing with development. What is our goal? Yeah, what a, what a great rallying cry to enable transformation, either in a business public sector, mm-hmm. uh, or even just some kind of a neighborhood initiative that you want to do of what's the vision and what's the rallying cry to get people on board. Exactly. And this has been an absolute delight. I, you know, we can oh, keep you. going on for yeah. hours and hours and hours, and I'm just kind of lapping it up as we go. But I do want to respect your time because I now understand very much uh, how busy you, you likely are with all these initiatives that are going on. I am curious if you're like me and, and any other listener, what is what's the best avenue to pick up your work? Do you have books? Do you are there films that you're like you got to watch this, or is it to go to your website? Is it to go to Yes Tomorrow? Like where well, do we just- get more engaged? That's a great question. I'd say go go to the website, which is Permaculture New York, spelled out, permaculturenewyork.com. And my latest film, you can find if you just did a, a search on, you know, uh, beating the world from our backyards, Andrew Faust, you'll find it. Uh, it's on Films for Action. I, it's about Food Independence for the Rondout Valley. So it's my latest case study in scaling up permaculture that I'm sharing and also using as a bit of an organizational tool in my local community. So I stacked functions with that latest film to make it something that gives people a tangible, what, what does this concept of being food independent and energy independent look like? And I think it's, I think a lot of people will find my latest film to be really useful and inspiring. Do you want me to put it in the chat, put a link to it? I, I will find it and I will okay, link it great. to, to all, this where, all the sites that it goes out to. Okay, great. And yeah, those are the best ways. The website and the latest film, I think are uh, good ways for, and the thing about the website is if you wanna send me an email on there, it's very easy. You just go to our contact tab on that website and that email comes right into my email box and I respond to, all communications in short order. I always really enjoy following up with anybody who's interested in what we've been talking about today. Yeah, no, I, it, this is phenomenal work and I, it has really pushed some of my own mental understandings of, uh, of permaculture, of urban design, particularly urban design. And I think that's, that's what I'm, I'm taking away from this is just it's a lot of hope and a lot of understanding, hey, we can use permaculture to, to scale up system that is not just how do we have, you know, food forest in everybody's front yard, but really applying yeah. that towards like the deep ecology of the inner workings of urbanity. So I, yeah. I thank you for the work. And I know that the world thanks you for the work. Uh, because it's Oh, just thank you. Yeah. And I, I, look, I look at it as a both end, Neil, you know, like both end. We, we both need the the forest gardens in people's yards, and we need the meta vision so that those are fitting into a whole landscape mosaic that makes good design and long-term inheritance sense. That's why I'm a big fan of commons and land trusts. Many of the people 
who plant many of these very large agroforestry plantings aren't properly either designing them to be diverse or protecting them once they do plant them with the proper conservation easements to allow them to be something to turn into old growth ecologies. Oh, but both and. I'm going to remember yeah. that. Well, Andrew, yeah. thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. And everybody that is tuning in, look for our show notes. We're going to link the books and the videos that uh, were mentioned here and where you can find out more about Andrew. Okay, everybody, that is a wrap. This is another just great episode that I'm so glad that you're able to tune in. And thank you for being interested in regenerative real estate. What we are trying to do is help people and planet thrive together by using the built environment as a catalyst. And so I've got a couple big asks for you. Number one is, can you please go to wherever you listen to this podcast, leave us a rating and review. Those actually go so far. And since this is such a passion project for us, we really wanna be able to attract the best thought leaders from around the world. Second, is that if you really like the content that we're putting out, you can find us on our own medium publication called Regenerative Real Estate. We also have a very active community on Facebook, which is called Regenerative Real Estate and Design, which you can request to be a part of, and we would love to have you. And third, this goes to what we do every single day, helping buyers and sellers demystify sustainability by working with people that want to either buy a property and are trying to figure out the financing of how do I actually live out my values? How do I put that water catchment system on there? Or how do I go uh, finance a solar panel PV array? Or maybe I want to live closer to nature. And what are the properties that are out there that I can do that? And so we represent buyers like that. We also happen to represent sellers that maybe they've already invested in sustainable features. Maybe they have a living building or a lead certified project. We want to help tell that story. So much of what goes on in the real estate industry is transactional thinking at best. And it translates down into Agents just really don't know anything about sustainability. And for us, we think that the value is there and we want to help highlight really the intrinsic value of it, not just the bedrooms and the baths and the square feet of what typical marketing goes on. So if you know of anybody that wants to buy or sell these kinds of properties that we we're talking about, please reach out to us at Latitude and be sure to subscribe for another great episode coming up next week.